Welcome to Normal Sampling. I'm Jeff Myers, and today's video highlights nuclear applications of incremental sampling methodologies, or ISM, at a large Department of Energy facility known as the Savannah River Site, or SRS. If you've ever wondered if ISM is applicable to high-level nuclear waste, the answer is a resounding yes. The breadth and complexity of this project necessitate a three-part approach. The Part 1 video covers the SRS liquid waste tank closure challenges. The Part 2 video covers robotics and data quality objectives. And the Part 3 video covers the ISM sampling design. Watching all three videos provides a better comprehension of the complex integration and problem solving necessary to achieving success. Let's take a look at the topics to be covered in Part 1. Part 1 discusses four main topics. First is an SRS overview, where it's located, the types of operations involved, and the specifics on why ISM contributes to assessing and sequestering the nuclear waste. Next is liquid waste, also known as high-level waste, and the closure challenges associated with it. Nuclear waste is beyond ordinary waste and requires advanced procedures and technologies. We'll examine a few of the challenges we encountered. Topic 3 is ISM Innovation and Integration. The tank farm staff recognized immediately the great promise in ISM when we first proposed its application, but integrating new techniques at a nuclear facility can be difficult due to existing procedures and expectations. And finally, sampling and analysis constraints. Today's application examines sampling of fine-grained materials from the bottoms of waste tanks. Many aspects of this process are not ordinary. We'll examine what impedes implementation and how we developed appropriate solutions. This includes the plutonium-238 button seen on the right that heats and powers NASA's most remote solar system probes. The Part 2 and 3 videos provide details on the topics covered there. The map on the left shows the Savannah River site location. SRS occupies more than 300 square miles of land along the South Carolina-Georgia border. Four SRS sites would cover more area than the state of Rhode Island. The right side shows a close-up view of the site footprint. Developed during the Cold War period, the government spread out the working sites for security reasons. They also gave the work areas nondescript names to minimize information releases. The yellow circles marked F and H near the center of the site denote the liquid waste tank farms we'll discuss today. SRS had two main missions. The first was to support national defense efforts, specifically for weapons, as shown in the pictures on the left. Locals used to call this the bomb plant. The second mission is to supply specialized isotopes for NASA's deep space equipment. This includes the production of plutonium-238, which helps to keep satellites both warm and powered SRS and other nuclear sites suffer from what I call the high five issues of nuclear waste cleanup. Nuclear facilities draw hypervigilant attention in many ways and from many quarters. The pictures at the bottom show some of the reasons. The left side emphasizes how personal protective equipment, or PPE, is crucial to worker safety. The right side shows heavy equipment being lowered into a tank to which the usual industrial safety issues and procedures apply but with the added issue of radiological exposure, the first of our high five hazards. Whereas worker dose is allowable, the objective is to minimize it. The next issue is the high profile of nuclear sites. The public is concerned about what goes on and potentially what is not going on at nuclear facilities, so these sites receive a great deal of scrutiny. Next, nuclear facilities are also highly regulated. Multiple federal and state agencies oversee SRS and the activities of other DOE sites. Because of the above items, costs are also high. Technical and safety challenges go beyond those of normal industrial operations, increasing expenses. And finally, the consequences of a radiological release include enduring environmental impacts which need to be minimized. SRS faces numerous operational closure challenges. The site has 51 large tanks with radioactive contents. Nothing trivial here. When we proposed ISM, only two tanks had been closed and the bulk of the work lay ahead. 
The next challenge is the difficult sampling environment due to access constraints, as you'll see in the tank designs. Next, SRS needs to minimize worker radiological exposure to ALARA levels, as low as reasonably achievable. Safety is a core value, and ALARA is one important aspect. Also, SRS tank samples undergo lengthy and difficult laboratory analytical processes. These are likely to make you appreciate your own situation and costs, as SRS sampling and analysis costs exceed those of most projects. Finally, SRS deals with a complex regulatory structure. We'll scratch the surface just enough to see the big picture. Before ISM can address the tank residuals issue, the tanks must be emptied of their contents. Tank closure systems must address three main waste components in the tanks, and the first two don't involve ISM. The first is sludge waste, the second is salt waste, and the third is tank residual materials, which is where we do apply ISM. Once the sludge and salt waste have been removed, the ISM process can begin for tank residuals. This diagram is a flowchart that shows the magnitude of the tank closure process with the sludge, salt, and residual wastes all appearing in the top box with the support facilities appearing below. This slide presents some of the unique implementation details involved with the handling and disposition of radioactive sludge and salt wastes. It is important to note that liquid waste is a top priority. The massive volume of radioactive waste creates the largest risk at the site, and the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, or SCDHEC, considers it the largest risk in South Carolina. The photos here show the sludge and salt waste processing, which provides an overall picture of the importance of tank closure and is a precursor to the ISM implementation. Sludge waste goes to the Defense Waste Processing Facility, or DWPF, where a vitrification process encapsulates the radionuclides in glass, which is poured into the stainless steel canisters seen in the center photo below, being held up by a forklift. The photo to the left shows a DWPF operator along with a vitrification process seen through the glass behind him. Salt waste goes to the Salt Waste Processing Facility, or SWPF. Salt waste accounts for about 90% of the waste. The waste is mixed with grout and stored in the massive saltstone facility, seen in the lower right. Closed tanks contain residues of these wastes. ISM characterizes the radionuclide concentrations before tank closure. The SRS regulatory structure is complex. In 1993, a federal facilities agreement went into effect committing multiple parties including SRS, DOE, EPA, and SCDHEC pursuant to CERCLA Section 120, RECRA Sections 3008H and 6001, the Atomic Energy Act, and Section 3116 of the Ronald W. Reagan National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, of 1995. The first three authorities are 40 or more years old. While the NDAA is more recent, a portion of this applies to nuclear waste cleanup, specifically wastes incidental to processing. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission oversees the NDAA activities. Tanks are termed operationally closed under the South Carolina Industrial Wastewater Permit that regulates their operation. Operational closure is also known as removal from service, a synonymous term. Tank closure program goals are relatively straightforward as this is largely a source control effort. The goal is to remove by pumping the maximum amount of sludge practicable. This means going the extra mile during the tank pumping process, not stopping at what is normal, convenient, or usual. The extra effort minimizes the amount of residual radioactive source material in the tank. Interestingly, exceptional success in sludge removal can impact ISM goals. Whereas this is good for the environment and reduces risks, thin veneers of residual material present challenges to in-tank sample collection, potentially impacting laboratory quality goals due to a lack of material. However, 
having minimal source material is probably the lesser of two evils. After the sludge and salt are removed, DOE begins the next tank closure phase as seen in the diagram below, showing the closure module development and review process. The three swim lanes, as they are known, track from top to bottom the roles of the major parties, DOE, EPA, and SCDHEC. DOE initiates documents starting with the recommendation to cease waste removal and others such as the readiness to proceed to the sampling and analysis process and a closure module, which contains sample analysis data from each tank or group of tanks. The regulatory agencies review and comment on these and other documents and resolve comments, including comments received after the documents exit the public review comment period. Following regulatory acceptance, the agencies provide closure plan acceptance and DOE grouts the tank to produce a stabilized tank, as shown in the black oval on the right. After DOE completes the tank stabilization, it issues to the agencies a final configuration report and an explanation of significant differences, or ESD, to document the tank closure details. After the agencies accept the final configuration report and approve the ESD, the tank exits the industrial wastewater permit. The ISM innovation poses potential obstacles. The issue is inserting a new construct into an existing operation and regulatory framework. With two tanks already closed using discrete sampling, the question was, given that a regulatory precedent had been established, is it better to maintain consistency or to apply ISM benefits to the remaining 49 tanks? Initially, we did not know whether the ISM benefits were sufficient to overcome institutional inertia. G.I. Joe, the robot shown below, and other robot generations assisted us in achieving consensus and overcoming the obstacles. In low volume residual situations, where tank cleaning achieved exceptional success, robots have difficulty collecting sufficient sample material to meet the Savannah River National Laboratory quality goals. Using ISM technology, we could leverage the limited sample material in a legitimate and efficient manner to create better samples and garner more reliable data for tank closure. Also, because the SRS work environment is driven by procedures, rewrites or new procedure development might be needed. This would trigger the development of new training along with the implementation of that training. As alluded to in the swim lane diagram, both pre- and post-ISM portions to tank closure exist in the process. The blue bars at the top and bottom of this flowchart show these pre- and post-ISM activities. The top bar shows the agency's concurrence to proceed with tank sampling. The bottom bar shows when and where DOE submits data to the residuals inventory report. In between lies the ISM portion. Before tank sampling begins, Operators perform a residuals mapping and volume estimation. Trained operators perform a video survey and assess the amount of material on the tank floor and in the floor mounds. They also look for coloration and particle size differences that could imply heterogeneities to be addressed during the ISM process. The two flowchart boxes below the visual survey, highlighted in yellow, show the in-tank sampling phases. As shown on the left, Sampling phases could be either for discrete or incremental samples. Phase 1 determines the number and location of sample increments to schedule in the tank. Phase 2 executes the sampling plan. During Phase 2, the operators glean additional information regarding the tank residual material depth, particle sizes, particle distribution, and other parameters. Using this new information, they update the initial volumetric survey and develop an uncertainty estimate on the volume. The two boxes below the final volume results, again highlighted in yellow, show the sample preparation, analytical, and data verification phases. The Savannah River National Laboratory performs these functions. Finally, the data quality assessment phase is performed, and the resulting data provide the inputs to the waste tank residuals inventory determination report. The Special Analysis and Performance Assessment provide a guide to the ultimate success for tank closure and environmental protection. The Generic Performance Assessment, on the right, 
is conducted on estimated residual tank masses to determine if overall impact is tolerable. This model features the F area tank farm as shown in the left diagram. The performance assessment is prepared by another DOE lab such as Sandia National Laboratories. The performance assessment produces a tolerable release model based on estimated radiological source terms for each tank. Once actual tank residual data are available, that is ISM data, these new data replace estimates and the model is rerun in a special analysis to confirm the new data do not introduce unacceptable risks. Potential hiccups exist, however. The tanks may have more residual material than expected. Next, material may be hotter, that is, more radioactive, than anticipated. Also, a geometry shift could occur. The line of tanks on the left lies closer to the streams. If these tanks show radiation levels higher than what the performance assessment modeled, the increased radioactivity released might introduce excessive risks. Of course, these tanks could also exhibit reduced radiological levels, introducing a welcome but unanticipated safety margin to the model. The purple lines emanating from the tank centers show the expected path of groundwater flow from the degraded tanks. The radionuclide content of the groundwater depends on multiple parameters, including the rate of tank degradation, the radionuclides in the tanks, the groundwater volume and chemistry, along with other factors incorporated in the model. A key feature of this model is the attribution of radionuclide concentrations to the center point in each tank. This attribute applies directly to step four in the data quality objectives process, which defines the applicable decision unit. The question now is, what's in a tank? Tanks all look identical on a plan map, but the interiors vary in design features, which impact sampling options. SRS has four types of tanks, with one type having two versions. In addition, as-built conditions in the tank pumping in preparation for closure can contribute to making each tank a new experience for the ISM sampling process. The diagram shows a cross-sectional view of a typical Type II waste tank. Concrete surrounds the steel tank on the sides, top and bottom, and in addition, this tank contains a solid concrete pillar in the center. In the bottom left, we see Type II tanks, as well as later tank designs, incorporate secondary containment structures to mitigate releases. Type I tanks do not have this feature and thus are more vulnerable to leakage and are a greater concern to the environment. All of the high-level waste tanks contain large volumes. Tanks range in size from 750,000 gallons to 1.3 million gallons. As a perspective, small tanks contain slightly more than one Olympic-sized swimming pool. Larger tanks contain just slightly less than two Olympic-sized swimming pools, but no one goes swimming here. Moving to the tank interiors, we find the insides are far messier than the schematics. The pictures show various stages of tank preparation before closure. In the upper left, we see cooling coils immersed in tank sludge. This reminds me of a Ghostbusters movie, except this is real negativity. On the right, we see salt-encrusted cooling coils along with salt accumulations on the bottom of the tank. In the center, the small photo shows a mound of residual material with a donut hole in the center. The hole was where the pump resided during tank cleaning. Pumping actions can contribute to both segregation and blending of the residual material and represent a heterogeneity concern to be addressed in the sampling design. The cooling coils in the last slide illustrate one of the many challenges to tank sampling. This slide lists some of the other constraints. Multiple tank designs and unique bottom conditions resulting from tank pumping make each tank a unique experience for ISM sampling. This includes potential heterogeneities in particle sizes, stratification, and particle densities that could segregate different radionuclides. Limited physical activity through the seven riser ports restrict opportunities to access all portions of the tank. This is an ISM concern, as all portions of a lot must be available for sampling to achieve correct and unbiased sampling. Floor pipes and vertical cooling coils introduce additional physical obstacles for all types of sampling devices. 
Alara concerns add an additional safety concern that most sampling programs do not face. Exposure and dose are both related to the time spent sampling, the distance of the worker to the radioactive material, and the shielding available to mitigate radiological effects. In addition, tank samplers, including robot operators, require special training and are limited in number. The core sampler seen in the photo below requires a pole approximately 40 to 50 feet long to collect residual sample material. It also doesn't work well for thin layers of residual material which, ironically, represent a tank situation with the least risk due to the lower source term. This wraps up our Part 1 presentation on liquid waste tanks at SRS. The final ISM sampling design incorporated many aspects of the tank features, as we'll see in Parts 2 and 3 of this series. Thanks for watching Part 1 of the Normal Sampling Series on Incremental Sampling for Radioactive Wastes. Be sure to watch Part 2, where we present the robotic approach to tank sampling along with the data quality objectives. And don't miss Part 3, where we explain the ISM sampling design to achieve tank operational closure. See you next time on Normal Sampling.